Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect Podcast, episode 28. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. We have our co-host as well. Rick is joining us, and Sebastian is not here today, but I'm sure he's going to pop up sooner or later. We miss you, Sebastian. So anyway, if you missed episode 27, we had Marcus Herney, and he is the front-end developer for Daedalus over at IOHK. It was a great episode if you want to learn what's going on in Daedalus, and if you want to learn some tidbits of what's going on with Shelly, go ahead and watch that episode. We have another special guest that we're really honored to have on today. Rick will be introducing him shortly. Um, quick housekeeping, uh, make sure that if you're watching this episode or you're watching the Cardano Effect and you support us, make sure you subscribe. It really helps a lot. Um, whether you like to just see what we're doing or you, you like the content, please help us move this Cardano Effect. We want to be the top crypto podcast, top Cardano podcast, top blockchain podcast out there. So leave a comment, subscribe, do all of that. Thank you so much. And none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. You are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. That being said, I'm going to pass it over to Rick. Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Hey, I'm doing great, Philippe. Thank you for asking. And we got a lot of stuff on the play today. We're going to be talking about Plutus, Marlowe, Hashoshi's YouTube channel, and some discussions about the latest news that's coming out in the blockchain world. A reminder to our viewers that this podcast is available on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify, so you can use your favorite streaming app to pull this um, podcast over. And uh, I wanted to point one thing out. I had my Went Taco shirt. I had to modify it based on Philippe's recommendations because <laughs> we've had someone bought a taco with ada and that was one of our users on the forum that was uh joshua unitas bought a taco with ada so if you go over to the cardano forum you can see uh that he's posted pictures and evidence that he purchased the tacos with ada so i'm retiring the shirt last time back to the cardano shirts okay all right so let me introduce our guest we have forrest with us today he has a YouTube channel. It's a very successful channel that covers all aspects of crypto. He is an Ethereum developer, software engineer, and he's with us today. Thank you for being on our program, Forrest. We're very happy to have you here. Um, so tell us a little, how are you doing today, first of all? Doing great. Thank you both, you guys, for having me on the on the podcast. It's been, uh, it's been a long time coming. I know we've been planning this for a while, so I'm super stoked to be here. Yeah, and I'm very glad that you came on the program. And uh, you're, you're, you have a YouTube channel, Hashoshi, uh, mm -hmm. or H Hashoshi Crypto YouTube. And uh, it's a really great channel. To, uh, can you tell us a little, a little bit about that channel and all the different kinds of subjects that you've covered on there? For sure, yeah. I started this channel just about a year ago and, and started creating content just for, you know, just for education purposes. I wanted to have videos that I could share with, you know, friends, family, colleagues at work that, you know, that wanted to understand blockchain. I found myself talking about the same things a lot. And then it turned into something that, that people enjoyed watching. So now I, I do videos about different projects and platforms and break them down from a, a developer's perspective, really give uh, concise information that's easy to understand, even if it's technical. That's the goal. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw that with uh, the Plutus video you did in describing the thorough documentation that's available for there. So how did, how did you become a blockchain developer? Like, where did it all start? My my blockchain and, and cryptocurrency journey, if you will, really started in you know, 20, like 2010, really. But, you know, end of 2009, early 2010, I was in high school at the time. I was sitting in my uh, my computer class in, in high school and I was reading the Bitcoin white paper on stumble upon. And I, at that time had no idea what I wanted to do. I had so many interests, but no, no real guidance on what to do. And blockchain just really appealed to me. And then fast forward through college, I studied uh, engineering, uh, software engineering and, and business. And then I managed to uh, make my way as a DAP developer in uh, in industry because it's just what I've been passionate about ever since uh, that that fateful day. I read that paper. Wow, you got in real early. You got in nice and early reading that paper early on. 
I wasn't even thinking about white papers. I think the first full white paper I read was the Cardano white paper. The rest of them were like, oh, they have a white paper. It must be uh, good stuff over there. Yeah, and I think white papers too are, are just these daunting things that, that, that people don't really enjoy reading, but they do because they want to learn what's going on. So I totally, totally understand that. It took me a while after that Bitcoin white paper to start reading more of them. I think the Ethereum white paper, it even took me a while after it came out to you know, sit down and start parsing through it and reading it. When did you start first developing dApps on Ethereum? How was that transition? I know Solidity is not a language that existed before. So how right. did you make that transition? So when I was in when I was in school, I think a lot of computer science oriented programs, they teach you the, you know, the object oriented methods of, of programming. They teach you maybe some, you know, some functional stuff like um, Haskell, what Plutus is based on, you, they teach you those core concepts. But then when you go to start building apps, there's so much more, there's so much more to it than those really, you know, small assignments that you're given. So for me, it was all about online communities when I went into, to go learn Solidity. And at the time, there actually were quite a few people on, on Stack Overflow, on forum websites, and even the documentation that really helped me pick up the ins and outs of how Solidity worked. Uh, the good news was that Solidity is also very similar to, you know, languages like in the C family and JavaScript family. So it was uh, less difficult to understand at least the syntax there. I think what's taken me time since I first learned it is the the nuances and how to program safely with Solidity in in public. So I've really been I've been working with Ethereum and Solidity in depth since like 2016, I believe. Um, that's really when I built something that really, you know, came to life. Uh, I tinkered with it before that, but, you know, Solidity has really only been around for, for that amount of time anyway. So it, it's still really young. So you, so you got started on Solidity pretty early in the process. What, what are the kind of applications or dApps or smart contracts that, that you've built or just some examples? The first thing that I ever built was a simple storage. I was one, I wanted to try and store um, sports scores there just to see if I could do it on uh, on a test net. Uh, the second thing I built was a, a gambling dap, uh, something very rudimentary, um, basically guessing a random number that was generated by the uh, um, by the, the block height and block cache. So, I mean, those sorts of things were really fun to build because you can start to understand how the language works and what the limitations are. Um, and there's very, you know, very low risk in, in that in that sense because no one else was using it besides me. Uh, and then, then you start to delve into more complicated use cases. And that's when my learning really started kicking off. Just always trying to come up with different ways that I could use contracts. I think the biggest thing for me is learning what shouldn't be on a contract. You know, what should you rely on uh, a normal application to do and then feed the contracts what they're supposed to do. All right. All right. So out of the three of us, you're the only software engineer. How challenging, what's the barrier to entry to become a Solidity, de Solidity developer? Is it something that, say, someone picks up coding as a, a hobby later in life? Is it something that you need a lot of prerequisite languages in order to build your confidence and build your repertoire over up to Solidity, or is it something that you could just jump into as a novice coder or a novice software engineer? I would say, and, and I, I've said this on a, on a couple of other videos that that I've you know that I've done. I think it's very easy rel relative to the the grand scheme of programming. Like you can pick up Solidity fairly easily if you can grasp the the concepts of software engineering. And obviously, it takes time to speak that language and understand how things fit together. But um, syntactically and structurally, Solidity is actually a pretty easy language to learn. I think that will get you a certain distance in terms of your, your DAP development journey. To get really good with Solidity and to be um, good enough with Solidity that you can deploy a production-ready application and I say production ready meaning that goes to public Ethereum blockchain and users actually use it safely I think that is a lot more difficult because you have to understand then not just the language and how to make your app work you have to understand how people are going to interact with it 
how people could potentially in a public environment attack it and break it and find vulnerability. So I think that requires a much deeper level of knowledge. So easy to start, hard to master would be the TLDR for that. Perfect. So, you know, to follow up on that, I noticed you said build an app safely a couple of times. And uh, one thing I like to point out, I, I just read an article today where, and it's on Twitter, and the, where a gentleman went to purchase with a cryptocurrency about $500,000 worth. And uh, I, I can't remember which one it was. And he used the buy market price. He wasn't familiar with it on how that process works. And what happened with this particular cryptocurrency that was at 49 cents at the time, and he had five, $500,000 worth of purchasing power, it drove the price of that cryptocurrency up to $2.50. Mm -hmm. This was on an exchange. And in the process of that happening, it sucked his entire $500,000, and he ended up paying 7,000% over the market value and so now he has a trouble ticket in with one of the major exchanges to say, hey, you know, how do I get refunded this? And I, I don't know how that's going to happen. Right. But yeah, I, and I know what you mean by safely build the DAP so that the software doesn't cause the user pain or right. lost funds. And also so that the user doesn't wreck themselves by, you know, doing something they didn't intend to do. Uh, right. Sometimes noobs will do that but sometimes the software doesn't prompt you hard enough to say, hey, don't push this button unless you know what you're about to spend. Right, yeah, I mean, in a traditional application, you know, you can also, you can find a bug and then you can patch it right away. With Solidity, with smart contracts in general, because of the nature of them, they're immutable and they create immutable transactions. So once you put that out there in the world and you have users on it, you can't hot fix. You can't push something out to fix a problem. You have to make sure that it's right the first time. So that is that is the key. And so that's why Solidity, even though it is by no means a a terrible language to code in, it is just a very, um, you know, there are a lot of pitfalls because people don't do their due diligence up front and understand how dangerous it can be not to audit your contracts. So my rule of thumb is if you ever build a contract, you should be um, partner programming, you should have a partner looking over your shoulder and you guys pass back and forth. And beyond that, you should get a third party to audit it before it goes to production, because that's it's just best practice, in my opinion. Moving back to the experiences that you have, you said that you built a smart contract for keeping sports scores and you did the gambling dap. What are some of the pitfalls or what are some of the challenges that you faced when you were um, building those dApps? Like, was there a place where you could test it before you compiled your code or did you get it third party audited? What were the what were the steps that you took to make sure that your project went correctly? Yeah, for those things, I mean, they were, you know, sort of just fun projects for me to do. And at the time I, th I was in school, so it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't for a client. And that, at that time, my main struggle was how do I how do I sort of check my work? Because even though I know that what it, you know, when I finally got things to compile and you get things to work in your, you know, your test environment, which for me was that online tool remix, which you can compile your contract, you can use their little the UI on the side to interact with your contract and test it before you end up deploying it. That stuff's great. But, you know, obviously I wanted to know, am I doing this the most efficient way? Am I doing this in the most secure way? You know, when I go to create a random number for this this gambling dap, am I doing that the correct way? And so there, those were questions that I don't think I could find answers to early on. Now there, these types of questions are answered daily on, you know, on forums and and etc. I think now the difference between 2016 and today is there's so much more out there in terms of tools, in terms of people who are skilled, uh, outreach and just documentation resources everywhere. So I think that's that's a huge benefit. I still use that stuff today. Wow, that's good to hear. And so uh, I, I was just wondering, did you want to go over to Plutus now and say, how does that compare to um, Plutus? Like uh, you saw some documentation on Plutus mm -hmm. uh, and you saw the Plutus Playground. Are those the kind of tools that should be out there for developers? And, and are there enough tools out there to get started on Plutus? Oh, right away. 
Yeah, so I think from the time that Plutus was first announced and the first iteration of Plutus really came into into the light, it, it's already seen a lot more support in terms of documentation than I think people realize. So that, that Plutus playground is a great first step. I think if you have a, a custom language and you don't have um, line by line examples for people to look at, you don't have a, an environment where people can drop code in and test it in their browser, you're already losing out on a lot of potential users of your, your solution. Uh, so the playground is great because even though it's, you know, there are only a few examples, you can see exactly what they're, what they're supposed to do and you can run them there. Uh, and the documentation for Plutus is pretty robust. Obviously, I think you can always improve documentation and always give more examples, always give uh, more information, but it's consistently updated whenever there are new versions. I mean, I think if you go in there, I think there are you know, at least four or five already builds for, for Plutus that have different documentation updates and, and such. Um, but the main difference between Plutus and Solidity is that Plutus is based on a functional language, which is Haskell. And that differs completely from Solidity, which is an imperative language. And I think the main difference between those two, if you want to think about it in simple terms, is that imperative languages like Solidity, they give you a lot of room to be creative because you're telling the computer exactly what steps that it has to take and how to take those steps to solve a problem. With functional languages like Plutus that's derived from Haskell, you're telling the computer what you want it to do and it already knows how it's going to go about doing that, right? So you have a lot more uh, a lot more predictable output for that code when you you know that you go to deploy it. And the reason for that is what we talked about before. It's people having less experience developing something with solidity and putting something out there that behaves in an unpredictable way because it it was vulnerable in some way. You mentioned that in your video that the for imperative languages, the state is constantly changing. So, mm -hmm. you know, as more developers come onto this ecosystem, it becomes harder and harder to delineate exactly what values equal what values because everyone's kind of creating their own rules. Um, and, and I wanted to compare that to a functional programming language. Is there a way for Plutus as a functional programming language or Haskell as a functional programming language to utilize some of the benefits of an, of an imperative programming language, um, mm -hmm. being more creative, but at the same time maintaining a certain level of rigidity? Right, and I think there's been talk of that in the, the Plutus ecosystem of how to make Plutus a little bit more stateful, meaning allow it to have some element of state and in, the rea in reality, I think it already does because Plutus has the ability to create transactions which have a certain state on the Cardano blockchain itself. So in that test net, if you were to deploy a, a Plutus contract, in a sense, you're modifying state of the blockchain, just not necessarily state within that contract. So I think it's it's always an interesting an interesting concept when you think about how can we create the perfect programming language because they're there really isn't one, but I think Plutus has take decided, or the, the Plutus team, I should say, has decided to take the language in a different direction because they realize that now is starting to get, we're starting to get to the point where specialization makes sense. So you can create specialized languages that make a, an acute design decision to go one direction over another. You know, where Solidity and Ethereum has always been you can build anything that you want with this and you have you have zero limitation except from the technical side of scalability etc you know i think plutus is more targeted at you know we're going to create possible potential for you know maybe some fringe supply chain use cases for financial use cases especially um, a lot of numbers game um, utilizations as well um, i can even see engineering departments using this for um, you know, for traceable calculations that are important for for operations, maybe in uh, in the space industry. I think that's where Plutus will will thrive. You know, that's oh. interesting that you can like project and say, "Hey, this is what this language could possibly be used for." That's the kind of visionaries we need in this space. So, if you were to compare the two, and you already did kind of compare the two, and you got Solidity 
uh, is the strongest point on solidity like flexibility? And then what is the really strong point on Plutus? Kind of like in simple terms, let's assume I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. What's mm -hmm. the strong point on solidity? And then what's the strong point for Plutus? Strong point for solidity. I think you hit it on the head. I think it's flexibility and the relative ease with which you can learn it and start becoming functional with that language. Um, and not to confuse terms, the functional language, Plutus, I think the strength there is that it's it's got a really high assurance level that what you develop is going to behave exactly the same way in your test environment as it is when you put it out there to the public. So when you build something, it's predictable. For me, I'm a developer. I think you ask any developers, we like deterministic stuff. And deterministic basically means that whatever you put into a certain system, it should spit you out the same thing as long as that input's the same. What you don't want is you don't want to be feeding in the number two and getting out different stuff at the end every single time. That's non-deterministic. We don't like that. Does that mean something's broken in there? Gotcha. That's a great explanation. I had a question because at, towards the end of your Plutus video, you were saying that Ethereum and Cardano are basically... They, they forked, I mean, not forked, but they're going separate directions. Yes, yeah, I agree. And um, but at the same time, Ethereum 2.0 and Viper, and it seems like Ethereum is moving towards maybe reducing that level of chaotic state within mm -hmm. Solidity and moving towards more functional, and um, you know maybe uh, the opposite, vice versa for Cardano. So is it possible that towards the end they're going to to be chasing the same use cases, or do you think that they're just going to completely diverge? Theoretically, yes, that's possible. Um, you know, and I can't speak for the path that they're taking with, you know, with Ethereum, but I believe, just based on you know my best guess, that what's going to happen is in this next iteration of the virtual machine for Ethereum, they're going to just open it up a little more with. Um, ability to use more different languages. Um, Viper will probably be included in that, but I don't think Solidity is going anywhere. I don't think that they've given up on using Solidity, even though it has its problems. I think Solidity is fixable, honestly. I think the infrastructure just needs to change a little bit from the virtual machine perspective. You can tighten up the rules a little bit and make it harder to make a mistake um, you know, with governance practices. So I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that it's going to be a situation where they abandon Solidity altogether and move towards functional. Have you done uh, any research or a lot of research on the KEVM using the K framework to make sure that the Ethereum contracts are are legitimate and doing what they're supposed to do? And do you think that maybe that's a possible solution for uh, improving smart contracts within Ethereum? Yeah, I definitely do. I think K framework migration for the virtual machine is it was a great move for the cardano team i'm taking you know and that's another thing people have to remember you know cardano has plutus and it's a functional language but they were smart enough to say hey people all over the world know how to use solidity they know how to develop stuff so we need to have a virtual machine that's going to let them do their thing and so a lot of work that was done before plutus was even um you know a quarter of the way there was done to create that that k framework virtual machine which like you said you know, addresses some of the problems that you see with Solidity. It's not all the language itself. It's also how it's reconciled in, and uh, executed by that virtual machine. Uh, so what that does is it basically takes some of the benefits that Plutus has, which is predictability, high assurance, and brings that into the virtual machine. Uh, that's that's the one of the main benefits in terms of, you know, effectiveness. And then efficiency is also a factor in terms of how fast things can run. I understand. I understand. Um, one more question. It might be a, a little bit unrelated, but you know, cryptocurrency, the blockchain space, cryptocurrency in general is very divided. It's camps existing everywhere. Yeah. You know, camp A wants to dethrone camp B. You know, Ethereum people hate Cardano people. Cardano people hate Ethereum people, and you know, everyone kind of hates each other, and they just stay within their own lane and mm -hmm. say that you know this is going to be the 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 one use case or the one crypto to rule them all and obviously speaking to you you think that there's 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 space for a lot of these projects to grow with their particular use cases yeah and uh, I, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that a little bit 
yeah, that's a topic I'm really passionate about <laughs> for sure. I think, uh, you know, if you look at how, how big the space is right now, in terms of dollar value that's been invested, sure, it's, it's, it's somewhat large. But if you look at the number of people who are interested in this technology, it's pretty small in the grand scheme of the world. You look at the number of people who truly understand how this stuff works and not just what it is, it's an even smaller community. And so I think for us in, in 2019, when no one in this market, Cardano, Ethereum, anybody have solved the problems that we want to solve, for us to be tribalistic about our projects, I think is the most detrimental thing we can do to the space. And the fact that people claim that the main goal is decentralization, yet we all form these coalitions and fight against each other, that runs counter to the whole concept that everyone's preaching about. So I think if, the, if we really want to capture value for the world, we want to be successful, all of these projects should be pooling effort in a way rather than competing. You know, the Cardano Foundation, the, you know, IOHK, essentially, you know, they, they can coexist with the Ethereum Foundation and quite frankly, you know, work together to solve a lot of these problems together. I think that would be more effective. I agree. And they probably should because uh, you see, I mean, we're still very early on in the whole blockchain yeah. industry. And uh, that was a great, great question you brought up there, Philippe, with um, these different coalitions trying to dethrone each other. It, but, but what people do is they say, hey, I think this is the right technology. So I'm going to go throw money at it. And then they go, well, I want to make more money off of it. Mm -hmm. And that causes them because they have value that they pumped into it. That causes them to make them want to defend their ground. So yeah. who, who are you going to defend your ground against? Well, right now, it's like a bunch of little kids in a playground fighting over, you know, who's get the, the sand shovel. <laughs> and then the, the adults are it's like JP Morgan, all the in Congress, the U.S. Congress and the parliament. And they're looking at it going, oh, yeah, they're just a bunch of little kids fighting in a sandbox. And uh, they don't take cryptocurrency seriously. Right. Um, but now they are. Now, I mean, they're starting to, right? They're starting to say, hey, we need to tax this stuff. We need to figure it out. Yeah. And, and I mean, ultimately, you have, you know, you're totally right. You have the, the, the tribe mindset becomes a huge detriment to the messaging that we have to have about cryptocurrency, why it's important, blockchain technology, why it's important as an, you know, an arbiter of change, but not an arbiter of chaos. I think that that is the wrong approach. If you want to get something, you know, get something done, infighting has never been the way, in my humble opinion, you know. I agree with that opinion. Well said, well said. Rick, why don't we discuss some of the recent news on Twitter with the lawmakers? Because I think this is a perfect segue to that. Agree. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to read that out. Congressman Sherman. Okay, so we have Congresswoman Caitlin Long, who's pro crypto, and she's been to the IOHK summit down in Miami, Florida. And I see her on Twitter a lot. She says a lot of a lot of things that are pro crypto without being totally in the bag. And she does a very good job. But Congressman Sherman is hostile towards crypto. So if you want to be tribal, why don't you, you know, write this guy a letter? So anyway, what he said is, um, an awful lot of our international power, now this is a US congressman, he says an awful lot of our international power comes from the fact that the US dollar is the standard unit of international finance and transactions. Clearing through the New York Fed is critical for all major oil and other transactions. It is the announced purpose of the supporters of cryptocurrency, us, to take that power away from us to put us in a position where the most significant sanctions we have against Iran, for example, would become irrelevant. So whether it is to disempower our foreign policy, our tax collection enforcement, or traditional law enforcement, the advantage of crypto over sovereign currency is solely to aid in the disempowerment of the United States and the rule of law. A congressman said that. What do you guys think? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, we know that both both ends of the spectrum are always going to have intense biases, right? And if you look at, you know, really, if you look at the the 
entire ethos of what he's saying. It is money talks. So let's not devalue it. Ultimately, I look at initially, why would someone in this position say something in that in that vein, right? First place you look when you look at a politician, no matter what topic or issue you're talking about, it's always who donates money to this person. Some of his main donation relationships come from people in the traditional finance market. I think one of them, I cannot recall the name of the company offhand, but it is a payment processor and they deal with, you know, um, business to consumer transactions and business to business transactions, I believe, from what I read. If that's the case, the main use cases for crypto is just that, taking the fees out of those sorts of processes. Why would they have an interest in getting crypto out of the way, right? But ultimately, if you think about this in the exact same way, when the stock exchange in New York moved from pieces of paper pinned up on a wall and tiles being moved around over to a computer, people said that this is a way that the most powerful and technologically savvy people are going to game the common folk out of their money. And all this anarchy is going to occur because we're giving all this power to the mean internet and the, the computers, the machines are going to take over the world. And it's the same alarmist sort of behavior that you see, you know, and to me, without even looking at the politics, it's all about the fact that it should be about education and helping people understand what the technology is, what it means, why it's important, and cutting out the noise on both ends, cutting out the noise from the hate side and cutting out the noise from the people who say that blockchain and crypto is going to solve world hunger, because that's not the way it works either. You know, there's a, a defined use case, there's a defined value, and it's never it's never black or white. It's always gray. Yeah. And that's a great opinion to have on it. And also along with that, my my take on it is I think this congressman is conceding that cryptocurrency it could be a superior form of currency. He doesn't come out and say it, but there's some sort of fear in the background, or he's being tribal himself by saying, hey. This is my U.S. dollar, and I think it's more important than crypto, and I think we should outlaw that crypto over there because I don't like what it does, and it undermines the U.S. dollar. But in the bigger picture, the guy who really gets it is Ron Paul. Like Ron Paul, I remember listening to him back in 2004, 2006, 2008 timeframe, and he, he always talked about the U.S. dollar having this significant trade advantage and a power advantage because it was used as a world standard. Mm -hmm. And when the U.S. does trade with some countries, there's a huge trade advantage because if a country A wants to trade with country B, they might have to go through the U.S. dollar to get there and get a proper transaction. And um, I think he's afraid of losing that. I think he's afraid of losing that that trade advantage where I think that's probably just an old fashioned way of looking at things, because if you have a better way of doing it, you know, if you have a currency that can serve as an international currency and establish a baseline that is not tethered to a country's interest, I think that's a better currency, not just technologically wise, but socially and culturally as well. Right. And I think it goes, it goes far beyond the idea of, of only the value of a currency. To me, you know, I, I'm a, a, you know, I was born in the United States. I love this country. I've lived here my entire life. You know, I have all the passion in the world for the United States. Ultimately, though, I find it offensive and myopic that people either attribute our, you know, level of status in in the global scale to only our dollar and our guns and our military. Right? I think this country is so much more than just that. Right. And so when you say as a congressman, our world power is derived from money or from our military, all you're doing is offending and de detracting from the actual value that we offer besides that. So I think that's really where where my head goes is if that's all our country has to offer to you, then I don't think you know America very well. That's just my opinion. Yep. And he said oil too. He's got oil in that sentence. So you can't leave out the big oil thing. <laughs> yeah. 
No, you're right though. The dollar has, um, yeah, you can argue that it's starved a lot of other countries currency because it's supposed to be the one world or the one that dominates everything. So, you know, uh, we see it with hyperinflation in other countries around the world and it's, it's directly tied to the U S dollar. You know, we're going to fall last, we will fall last, but there are other countries that are much smaller that don't have everything, um, put together economically, they're going to be the ones that fall first. I'd like to go back to one of your points that you were saying at the end. Um, Forrest, you were saying about how, you know, there's a fine line. It, it doesn't it doesn't have to be to polar extremes. You know, blockchain is not going to solve world hunger or it's not going it, to, it shouldn't be looked at or the dollar shouldn't be looked at as the standard for everything. And we can find some kind of middle ground. Right. And I think that every other, every cryptocurrency and every blockchain project, you need to make sure that you delineate, get the head out of the clouds and see exactly what this project can do because we're no different than the dollar if we think that we're just going to have this one cryptocurrency project rule everything. Because what's the difference? What's the, I mean, I just don't see the difference. And whoever got in first is going to be the ones that rule just like right. the, the dollar system, so the fiat system. And there's a lot of animosity towards this statement whenever I say it. But ultimately, I find the approach that people take to evaluating a cryptocurrency project, and, and I'll, I'll go through the exact process. It is, look at a cryptocurrency. Is it 100% decentralized? If no, I don't want it and I hate it, right? I'm sorry to report to everybody, there isn't one none of these projects are fully decentralized. And I am the biggest advocate in this space. I will be in this space till I take my last breath. But I also don't believe that human beings right now, socially, socioeconomically, are ready and comprehend the types of changes that have to occur in our society for an actual decentralized solution to occur and to be sustainable. If you look at the Dow hack in 2015, Perfect example. All the people on Reddit, all the people online are saying, this is a great decentralized world computer that we're on. You know, look at this venture capital startup, the Dow, they're setting up this whole thing where they can invest in companies and create this huge fund with no central control. It's like a community. Little did they know the smart contract was built with huge holes in it. Reentrancy hack occurs and 50 million goes missing in a matter of hours. What did people do in that? In a decentralized environment, you have to throw up your hands and say, this is a mistake we all hold responsibility for. But that's not how it worked. People looked at Vitalik, please save us because all of our money is gone. And then that whole you know rollback, the reorg occurred, and we have a, a, a fork. What did the people do? They looked to a central party, an authority figure, to fix the problem. And if we want to talk about a decentralized world, that type of behavior from people should speak to how ready we are for that. In my, in my humble opinion, and I know people hate it when I say that, but ultimately that's what's going to have to happen. A lot of stuff has to change. That's a very rational point. Very rational point. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see any flaws in that argument whatsoever. It's uh, the people that are shouting decentralization to its fullest. It's only because they haven't lost their money yet. If they're not the ones affected, then it's all right. But right. you know, if they lost the value, I understand yeah. the value of that, and I talk about it on my channel. It's where it, this is the distributed decentralized movement. I'm about that, and that's what I love as well. But I also am trying to be pragmatic about it and understand what can we reasonably get out of this as a society in the short term, because there are things that are going to take generations to to modify behavior. You know. It's the same way that, um, you know, generations before ours in the late 19th century, for example, had no understanding and no concept of the fact that they could ever step foot in a state a coast away. It just, it didn't really, it didn't make sense to them because they didn't have that means of transportation. Now, if I say, I want to just go and take a quick trip over to, you know, to Chicago, plane, train, automobile, and I'm there. They had no clue how that worked. And commerce followed suit. 
commerce was really small. And, and so again, with the internet, people were like, well, I'm just limited in what I can understand because I can go to the library and read books, but I can't search. It takes me time. And now kids know more than the most educated people did in, you know, times long before now. So it's, uh, it's going to take time for humans to catch up to the tech that we're building. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's interesting. I want to go back to the point that you made about um, like Ethereum when the DAO hack occurred and people looked to a central authority and said, hey, fix this for us. Mm -hmm. And recently we had, I believe it was the um, Binance had the 7 million Bitcoin got mm -hmm. um, stolen or whatever happened to it. And the first thing that gets talked about was, hey, how do we bail this out? Could we roll back the blockchain and stuff like that? And all of a sudden, now it's starting to sound like fiat again. And also, and another interesting thing along that lines is I always compare things like Ethereum Classic, Ethereum, and Cardano and say, okay, which, you know, where do I want to hedge my bets here? I mm -hmm. like Ethereum because it's great for trading. It moves quickly and all that. Ethereum Classic is like a good hodl, in my opinion, not financial advice, of course, but because to me, it seems more decentralized and immutable. I'm not sure, but it just appears that way. Um, and then Cardano, because it's so new and it's like, yeah, okay, you got another generation coming on. But so another thing that I, I think about between those three different types of cryptocurrencies is like you got Ethereum Classic that's pure proof of work. Okay. And most average people don't understand what proof of work. They don't know what it is. They just want to spend their money and trade their money and it works and it does whatever it does. Mm -hmm. um, but you got Classic on solid proof of work. You got Ethereum on proof of work transitioning to proof of stake, and they're making good progress in that direction. And then Cardano, pure proof of stake. So kind of a segue off of that is, do you think proof of stake is the way ahead for cryptocurrencies? I mean, we know proof of work is proven. Like we know that can be secure in nature um, but proof of stake, I mean, is that the way ahead, you think? Yeah, I mean, you said it best. I think proof of work, it's really good at what it does. It's really effective. It's just not very efficient, right? And so proof of stake was the answer to that. And there are so many different flavors now, proof of stake. You have the delegated proof of stake. You have proof of stake where it's all about how much you stake and lock up in a network token. Then there's stake in terms of voting for a block directly. Um, there's stake where you're not locking tokens There's stake where you are locking tokens. There's stake where you can get rewards and you can't. So there's all these different flavors. I think proof of stake is going to be a part of the long-term solution. I think that the problem with proof of stake in its current state today, and that extends to the delegated proof of stake styles is that it's very hard to achieve true randomness in a process. And so you're always going to have instances where theoretical attack vectors come up where either the wealthiest parties can collude, take advantage of their status in the network, and for lack of a randomness aspect of the protocol, they can then start to take control, especially in networks where the pool of validators or block makers are very small. Um, so it's uh, the continuous accrual of wealth just makes them even more powerful. Then you have other proof of stakes where there, are, there is randomness, but then the reputation system then becomes the main target for hackers and people gaming the system. So if you have a reputation system and randomness to help you uh, distribute a little bit more and spread the love, if you will, then how do you make sure that you're preventing denial of service attacks or spam attacks on the reputation system? So if someone just really doesn't like somebody, can they go on and create a massive number of nodes and vote them down because they don't want them involved or massive nodes and vote them up because they want them to have power. So there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. There's a recent example in the news. Um, I can't remember the exact context of the article, but there was one person that biased 80% of the votes went in their favor because the majority of individuals spread out voted one direction, mm -hmm. but the one person with the heaviest amount of stake said, I'm going to vote this way. And it tipped the vote in the favor of the way they wanted to vote. And uh, so that's like a trade-off in, in proof of stake. So I'm thinking yeah. going forward, it's probably a hybrid solution. 
There's probably sure. a combination between some things are going to be proof of work and that works well. Things that like are high value proof, um, storage, like um, I want to store value. Boom. You know, proof of work yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, I wonder if the security of proof of stake will ever achieve proof of work. It, it sounds like based on some of the Cardano research papers, it is. Uh, what do you guys think? Yes, yes. Um, you you should check out the IOHK papers portal and look at the Ouroboros protocol. And um, anyone who's watching this should look at it. Um, but once again, we haven't fully deployed Shelly yet, so time will tell. But I know that governance is an issue and what you were saying about how the wealthiest right. actors can um, collude to downvote or flood certain pools and decrease their profitability. Right. It's definitely a game of the rich and proof of stake and proof of work as well. But there are Certainly. some issues that need to be solved. So we'll see how Cardano approaches that in the future. But moving forward, I know we're getting to the last part of our um our, our podcast wanted to jump over to the reddit questions because yeah, i don't want sure. to take up all your evening thank you so much for this um we're having a blast yeah um, we can do it again too not like this is the last the last moment either perfect 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 Thanks. you're always <laughs> welcome on yeah we're gonna need it yeah because <laughs> there's so much more we could go over right now so <laughs> yeah reddit fully Yes, yes. Are you sorting by best or top or because I just want to make sure we're on the same we're on the same page. I did a copy and paste with uh, General Zod 7 at the top. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So you can go ahead, Rick. Okay. So General Zod 7, thanks for asking your questions here. Always good stuff coming from you. All right. Uh, so question one here is, and these could be for myself, Philippe, or Forrest. Uh, question one, what are some great use cases you can think of for smart contracts and dApps, what are some of the things you have built? So let's start with the what What do you think are some great use cases you can think of for smart contracts and dApps? And I would say specifically for Cardano or Plutus. Cool. Yeah, and I think for Cardano and Plutus, I think that one of the primary use cases to go after early on would be to build, try and build out a, a, a payment solution with an escrow service similar to what PayPal does. Um, you know, if I were a dApp developer going at Plutus full time and I said, this is an opportunity. What can we build with this? Take advantage of the high throughput, take advantage of the high assurance, predictability, focus on finance. That's where I would go. And then I would try and put that in front of some of these um, apps like let go, like offer up, like even eBay and say, hey, we have a way that you can cut costs by a significant margin doing cross-border payments, we can serve the same escrow payment structure that PayPal does, do it with crypto, do it with ADA, call it a day, dust your hands. That would be where I go. Wow, that sounds brilliant. All right, Forrest, I want to bounce my ID off you and tell me what you sure. think. Yeah, I think something that, that we should make is coupons on a blockchain. And people think I'm crazy. I've said it before and I get comments that say, what are you, crazy, you coupons? And I'm thinking, you know what? Women love coupons. We go to the store, my wife forgets a coupon's on her. A coupon's like a smart contract. If you purchase this product by this date in this quantity, here's your rebate. And that'd right. be awesome. And she forgets them at home and she checks her purse and goes, oh, I forgot my coupons. If it was on her smartphone and it was a smart contract, click, there's my coupons, right? Right. I don't know. Is it crazy? Am I out to line? Yeah, I mean, I think I think in a in a sense, the way that you go and you start to implement something like that and adapt, you got to gamify it a little bit. You've got to say, um, you know, if you go to partner stores, you buy X number of things, almost like that that lolly application where you get paid in crypto at a shop. Um, there would have to be some sort of almost game to it. Like I'm going to shop at these places because they offer me crypto cash back, crypto rebates based on the coupons and they're all digital. Right. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the idea is not totally crazy. Plus there's uh, 7 billion people in the world and half of them are women. So if you want to bring women in the blockchain space, give them I some. Lo coupons. I love me some coupons too. So men and women. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. All right. So um, that was good. That was good. So the next part of the question or what are some of the things that you built that you've touched on earlier? You touched on those games. Let's go to the second question from General Zod7. Or, or do you want to touch on what are some of the things that you built? You built the um, the sports game and the gambling app or DAP, okay? Yep. 
Um, I've done quite a bit of stuff with, uh, with ERC-20 token structures, um, building those for, you know, for fun. I'm working right now on my second ERC-721 non-fungible token. I'm actually building a project just for fun for myself. Um, I'm building a non-fungible token game style platform for my, one of my favorite YouTubers online, just to see if, uh, it's not even in the crypto space. I love photography and videography. So I'm going to try and create something that videographers and photographers can, can play around with in a non-fungible token. So if I can ever finish it, cause I have so little time to spend on my own little pet projects, I'll, I'll share more details, but non-fungible tokens are cool. Awesome. Good stuff. Awesome. All right. Second question from General Zod7 is, uh, what do you like most about Plutus? And do you view it as a strong language to attract developers? Uh, I, the thing that I love the most and has caused me the most problems with Plutus are both the same thing. I love that it's based on Haskell, a really um, well-defined language. And they have some of the most talented Haskell minds working on Plutus. Problem with Haskell is it's a challenging one to learn, but it's very powerful. So I'm still in the process of learning the ins and outs of Haskell and you learn by doing. So it's just a matter of keeping at it, working on it and learning the ins and outs. But um, Plutus is great in that sense because it is going to be extremely predictable and all the Haskell uh, devotee, devotees out there are going to feel right at home using it. So that's, that's goal number one. If we're the Plutus team, go after the industry people that already know Haskell and show them this thing. Awesome. That sounds good. And the last one here, I'll try to get to, uh, are you currently invested in Cardano? Well, yes. actually you invest your time. So I invest my time and, uh, I will continue to, I will continue to create content. So yes, that's a good response. Yeah. Um, so next question. Um, sure. so we have Johnny JJR said, nice. I will be all ears. So, Thank you. Um, then we have OJO far. This will be good. Okay. Then we have S R T E H T, a bunch of characters. Any good book recommendations? Uh, a lot. Um, I'm an avid reader, so that's a fun fact about Hishoshi. I read a lot. Um, one of my favorite books in terms of non crypto related is Thinking Fast and Slow by an economist, Kahneman. He's great. Um, that book's just about the way that the human brain works, how you think about things when you're thinking about things very specifically and analytically and when your brain just makes decisions for you. Really cool book. Um, if you're an investor, also good. It'll help you understand decisions that you make. Um, in terms of other books in the crypto world, I have some of my bookshelf here, actually. Um, I would say this is a good one. The Truth Machine, it's a book about blockchain. It's a book about crypto in general. It's a great, great book to, to read. And there's another one called Crypto Assets specifically. Um, but if you type those two names in on Amazon, it'll be the first result for both. But those are both really good books in the blockchain world. Yeah. The thing I like about The Truth Machine is it talks about the history. It helps you bring in the history and it talks yeah. about how the people interact and uh, more so than the code. Whereas uh, mastering Bitcoin gets a lot into the code. The truth machine gets more into the people and how they interact. For sure. Good stuff, man. Great Thank stuff. you. Sorry, Philippe. Go ahead. Oh, no, that's it. That's good. Good. Um, great response to that question. Do you want to get the next question, Rick? Yeah, there was uh, another one. So so, so, so from uh, Vitus, V-Y-T-T-U-S uh, user. Thank you for your question. And um, Vitus asks, what are the most important features for a developer to choose a platform to run a DAP? Was Cardano your first choice? Yes or no or why? So what are the most important features for a developer to choose a platform to run a DAP? Number one, if you watch my channel ever, I'd spend a good amount of time in every video about a platform, about documentation. How easy is it gonna be for me as a developer to take your platform and do something with it. If I go and even if your platform and I read your white paper, I read and I understand what the platform offers and I don't know how I can implement something and if I can do it quickly enough for whatever engagement I'm doing, 
it's already dead in the water for me if I can't get it quickly enough. Because the reality is everyone's kind of got limited time. And if you're not using a language that we know already, like Java, for example, it's going to take me some time to learn the nuances. So documentation is number one. Then below that, you know, platform that you choose, I think is now more so even depending on what, what you need as an offering. You know, Zillica is a platform out there today that has a, a relatively limited smart contract language that is a functional but non-Turing complete language. So it doesn't have as much um, ability per se, but they've managed to solve the problem of transaction throughput in terms of um, computational and network sharding. So if you need an application that can just go really fast and you can get transactions through quickly, Zillica might be a great option. Then if you need a little more freedom and flexibility, you might need to go for something like, like Ethereum. If you want to build a full scale DAP with very little extra excess code in a server, maybe that's your option. Then you have Plutus and, and Cardano as another option. Um, so those are the, those are the routes that I go. It's primarily how feasible is it for me to get this done quickly enough with what's out there and then what platforms specialized in what I need my app to do. Thank you. You know, your experience here is really paying off. It's an incredible amount of experience that you have in, in the blockchain industry. Super and, blessed. I'll say that. Yeah. And Philippe, I missed a question there from SRT uh, J51, a complex name. Um, that, uh, that person also asked, in a future world where multiple blockchains and other distributed ledger platforms all support the same programming languages, does the current number of dApps getting published to a platform reflect the platform's potential for success? So I think what they're asking here is an example. On, on Ethereum and EOS, you have an extremely large number of dApps. Mm -hmm. And on other platforms um, like Tezos, they have fewer. And then Cardano, you don't have any yet. Um, yeah. Or just barely starting. And so they're really asking, does the number of dApps determine success? I mean... No, in my opinion, I, I think if you look at how low the barrier to entry is for a Solidity developer to, to deploy an app, adapt to a test net and then to a, the main net, just even if they're taking a training online, you know, even if it's out there, if it's not active and people aren't using it, what is its value, right? Except it's actually almost a detriment because that just means it's sitting there and it's taking up space. So. No, it is not the only indicator of how good a platform is or how mature a platform is. Um, but it is also an indicator, though, of whether or not it's it's usable. If there are, if there's a mainnet, for example, and there's documentation and tools and marketing and there are zero dApps, that shows you something's wrong. Something's not working because people aren't using it for some reason. So, I mean, if there's. At the extremes, yes. But if you're looking at like, there's a thousand dApps here and 600 here, no. Okay. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the language question, will they be built on the same languages all over the place? I also think that's probably a no as well. I think what we're going to see is we're going to see blockchains, Cardano, Ethereum, all of these platforms out there that we see today will have a culling where a lot of them, you know, die or they get change do they amalgamate they morph they change new companies we haven't even seen yet all of these platforms are going to start to connect to each other in an interoperable way so you're going to have a zillica chain for example that is really good and really specialized at taking in high volumes of transactions then you might have a platform that's more so for these really high security slow verified transactions all these blockchains are going to serve a purpose and it's going to be the internet of blockchains. So the world of interoperable blockchains that have specialized purposes, languages. I mean, it's the same thing. Programming languages are so different today in their application. Netflix uses Python for a lot of their stuff. SpaceX uses Haskell. So it's like, there's all sorts of stuff that you can do with different languages. Wow. By far the most uh, I've learned in episode yet. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> so we have a few more questions um sure, we have a question off. okay um from a question from proto man 86 based on what you've seen so far do you feel that cardano provides a large enough advantage over ethereum and other smart contract platforms to potentially draw creators from them to the cardano ecosystem uh they made the right move by allowing solidity 
smart contracts in theory to be deployed in their, you know, their main releases. That's a smart move because that means developers are already in the space, but don't want to learn Plutus or don't know Haskell. Like I didn't know Haskell before can say, oh, I'll just do solidity instead. That's a good thing. So that'll help. I think that the thing that Cardano has is they have the ability to have learned from all of the mistakes that Ethereum, the Ethereum foundation has made up to this point. And so now I have a feeling that what's going to happen is, is that Cardano's roadmap of all these features that they're building to try and put in the mainnet. And the main, the number one criticism laid towards Cardano in general is when is everything that they're talking about? And we know that they have the, the capability to do, when is that going to be real? Right. I have a feeling that what's going to happen is we're going to have this huge tidal wave of big announcements and big releases coming toward like really at the same time. Like towards the end of 2019, early 2020, I think Cardano is going to come splashing in full scale. And I think Ethereum 2.0 is going to be rolling in with the tide as well. You're going to have other platforms delivering their mission. I've got a video coming about, about, um, out about Aeon and their interoperability solution. All these platforms, we're starting to see this, like, you know, this tidal wave brewing right now, I think, of big names and big releases. Cardano has a good chance of making a splash, I think. That's awesome. All right. Um, Philippe, there's another question from Jay Rusa Ada, and uh, he says, Hey guys, I'm, I'm subscribed to both channels. I love the content. I think we should make Heshoshi a Cardano ambassador. I agree. And his question is the, um, as a developer, what do you think is the best way to attract more developers to the Cardano ecosystem? Or is it just strong and functional code or do we need something bigger in order to say, use our system over, let's say, Ethereum or EOS, which was kind of what you were just talking about. Right. I think you should spend less time talking about other platforms and more time talking about why yours has things that, that are great to offer. So I think people always get this twisted. It's like, how can we say how great we are without saying that we're better than something else? I think it's all about, you should use Cardano because... We have a language that is built from the ground up with a really high assurance, provable programming language. And we're going to provide all these tools for you to get started, even if you know nothing about Haskell, you know nothing about Plutus. And we're going to get you there. So that looks to me like more Udemy courses. I was so stoked when I saw they had Plutus and Marlowe on Udemy courses. Do another one, a boot camp that's free that anyone can use to set up your development environment, how to get started with Haskell, learn the ins and outs of Haskell, how to get started with Plutus, how to set up a test net on your local machine, how to deploy to your local machine test net, best practices, you know, give, give them all the tools they need to learn the basics and then the creative souls that do this work are going to fall in love and they're going to do this forever. So that's, the, that's the main thing for me. If, if I had a, an online course that taught me end to end what to do, I'll use that platform for sure. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. I'd like to plug the, I'm not a software engineer whatsoever. I've never written a line of code, but I took the Marlowe Udemy course and mm -hmm. I, it, it was, it was a drag and drop the functionality of just clicking certain sections and building a smart contract was yeah. relatively easy. It's and like a logical thing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And it was fitting puzzle pieces. You know, you want to give someone this amount of ADA when, you know, escrow this amount of ADA and release it at this at this time after this amount of blocks. It was relatively easy. So, yeah. And, that, and that's the other thing, too. I think people I, I get this question a lot where people are saying, oh, I'm, new, I'm new to programming. You know, I don't think I can do it. I want to because I want to get in this space, but I don't think I can do it. The reality is, is that no matter who you are, even if you're not good at math, you know, that's another misnomer. If you're not good at math, you can't do programming. That's garbage, not true. But the reality is, it's just like speaking another language. You just, your brain is capable of doing it, no matter who you are. It's just a matter of understanding the way your brain wants to learn it. For me, I was in school for two years before I think some of the concepts that were important really clicked for me. And it was all about one professor teaching it in a way that made sense to my mind. You break it down in the way that you want. So if you try and you can't do it, try a different online course. Try something else because you will get it when you find that 
um, analogy for your brain to take hold and, and understand the concepts. That's all it is. Sounds good. Sounds good. So next question we have is from uh, Gorgos19. Have you tried writing dApps for Cardano? How's the experience compared to Ethereum? Have you tried to deploy Solidity card? Have you tried to deploy Solidity contracts on the Cardano network? I'd implore you to check out Hoshoshi's channel, Force's channel, and look at his in-depth review of Plutus. And he, you kind of go into depth about what your experience was like in in Plutus. But if you wanted to touch a little bit more on that question. Yeah, yeah. I think the you know the short story, the short version is yes, I've used Plutus. Um, I have also tried to deploy Solidity contracts that I've built to the the KVM. Um, pretty good experience with that too. Uh, it's very it's very much the same experience as doing it with a normal EVM. Um, in terms of Plutus, for me, my only roadblock and my only bottleneck has been learning Haskell and getting the most out of it. Um, so. In terms of what's there so far, for someone who knows Haskell, I think that testnet's a great place for them to, you know, learn fast, break stuff, and you know, enjoy themselves. For me, I'm still learning. I still have the Haskell training wheels on, so um, you know, I understand the benefits of the language and what it's all about. But I think the deep details, I'm still learning. So um, more to come on that for sure. As I learn more, I'm going to keep creating content. So that'll be good. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, our last set of questions here is from BCH Buck. And this person asks, uh, when you started looking into Haskell, did you learn it while picking up functional programming paradigms at the same time? Or did you get a handle on functional programming first? If you were learning functional programming, I don't recommend you learn it with Haskell. That's my opinion, because Haskell has other nuances that you have to learn. If you want to learn functional, first of all, I'd say you just quickly do a Google search on functional versus imperative languages or watch my Plutus video. I talk a little bit about it there. Shameless plug. But if you want to learn that, I, I say go to codeacademy.com and take the Python training there. And it's I think it's free, actually. And learn how Python manages data and how everything works there. It's a great breakdown. And once you know Python in a basic sense, you then know how functional programming languages are put together. So I think that would be a good start starting place. I want to thank Forrest for joining us today on the Cardano Effect. We really appreciate you. We really appreciate your time. It's a Friday evening. You're you're giving us our, your time. You make wonderful videos. The content is is very the the production value is very good, and the information that you're producing is also very good. It's very refreshing. And we're going to link all your social media handles down below, and including your YouTube channel. Thank so you. you should consider subscribing to his channel if you're not already subscribed. So that being said, Forrest, do you have any last words for the viewers of the Cardano Effect? If not, we'll wrap it up. My only words would be thank you very much for listening. And, you know, really just on honestly be proud of being a part of the space because it's a great space to be in. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Until the next episode.